One of my favorite feelings ever is waking up the morning after an amazing gig. And you know, normally you sleep over at a friend's house or something, so you have someone to recap it with. But I just have you guys in the camera, so I'll give you guys an amazing recap of what happened yesterday and what to expect today, because it's another weekend uh, spent in a brand new city, and this weekend, Super Progressive, is in Glasgow, and this one is gonna be for the books. It's already been insane, and the schedule today is just gonna get better and better. So, let's start with, uh, let's just start with last night, and then we'll work backwards. Um, last night, Sasha and John dig weed um, at SWG3. Now, I'll be pretty brief with this, but this was the best I've ever seen Sasha and John together. So I've seen Sasha and John together um, in New York, in Miami, um, trying to think, oh, and in Manchester. Manchester gig was amazing. This, this just music wise for me was the best I've seen them. The Glasgow crowd is kind of like the Manchester crowd. I find that like the more, <laughs> the more north you go in the UK, um, you know, the more nice the people get, but also more freaking up for it the crowd is, and these guys were pretty crazy. Um, but the music, I don't know, I'll describe it as, when I've seen Sasha and John uh, in the past gigs, the music's like pretty hard hitting. It's that balance of John's like dark grooves, hard hitting grooves with Sasha's, you know, like kind of melodic, like twist to things, but I just felt like last night was the most fun I've seen them have playing together up on stage. And I think it translated to the music because there were some like party starting jams, some like hands in the air, kind of like ravey moments that I just felt like I hadn't experienced at the previous gigs. And this one was, so this was just, it was different. It was an absolute blast. All the other gigs are amazing too but it's cool to go and see these guys uh, in different cities and for them to play to different crowds in different ways. It's what makes them, you know, two of the greatest of all time. So outside of that, uh, I have to say, I have to say a huge, 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 huge thank you to a couple people right now. Um, I'll, I'll, staying at the gig, uh, staying with the gig, I first wanna say a thank you to uh, Freya and Rebecca. Now, uh, Freya and Rebecca were opening for Sasha and John. And if, you know, they, um, they're pretty, uh, they're like very active DJs in the scene right now. They're like, schedule is pretty relentless. But one thing that's really cool is that they have a transitions bedrock mix. And I'll throw that link to that mix in the description of this video. But they were opening for Sasha and John. And it was a proper, proper, proper warm up set. You know, I walked in and I felt like the room, I was like one of the first people there. I wanted to go early to support. And I felt like the room was, you know, chilling at like, say like 108, 110 BPM. Very like exotic grooves. Never heard a track of any of these tracks before. And it was just a proper opening set. And by the end of their two hour set, you know, Sasha and John, are on stage, you know, encouraging them as they're about to take over and they have the room ready to go for Sasha and John. So first of all, their opening set was quality. Uh, and I encourage, I encourage uh, anyone who sees this video to go check them out. Their transitions uh, mix is a great kind of gateway into their work. And I also wanna thank them because Freya, this is just really cool of like someone who has access to stuff that I'll you know, that is way out of my league, uh, helping me out. She put me not only on the guest list, but um, gave me a back, like gave me backstage access. And I'm not one to really chill backstage at gigs. I mean, trust me, for this gig, 95% of the time, I was in the crowd going crazy. But, um, but it was really, really cool because with Sasha and John, they always do a really good job of making sure it's not like a zoo backstage, like it becomes for a lot of these big, big shows. It, so there really wasn't a lot of people back there. And one of the highlights for me was when um, Freya and Rebecca were playing, there weren't a lot of people backstage. And John came early, as he does, to support 
the opening DJ and kind of see what the room's looking like. And I got to have like a really, really nice conversation with him, which to me just like, he'll never know how much that means to me, but it means the world to me. So, and that wouldn't have been possible without um, Freya being really nice. And this is Freya who I opened up for last weekend in Cardiff. So um, yeah, she just did, it was really, really nice of her to put me on the list, get me backstage um, because I got to, I don't know, I got to speak with John a little bit and just about, just about everything. And it was, it was really, really, really awesome. Um, the opening set was really awesome. So shout out to um, Freya and Rebecca. Rebecca's from Manchester, so I was able to speak to her about all of, you know, what I've been experiencing over the past two months living in Manchester. Um, and they were just super cool. So as much, uh, as much, you know, I love Sasha and John's set, and I also love the chance to make two new really good friends in the industry. And that brings me to the other best part of the night, which is going to these gigs with these progressive legends lends itself to meeting so many um, followers and just people in the super progressive community. And I met over like 30 people last night. Um, and yeah, you guys are just the coolest people ever. Thank you, thank you, thank you always for coming up and introducing yourself at gigs. I'm always like, what's your handle? Because, you know, oftentimes we DM and go back and forth in the comments hundreds of times online and then we actually get to meet in person. And you guys all always um, make these events. It's like, I always say this, it's like clubbing on steroids for me. I go to these events alone and it's gotten to the point where I know I have it's like the feeling of you're going alone, but you know you have 20 or 30 friends, like real friends in the audience. And it's just, it's just the best feeling ever and by far and away the best part about um, what Super Progressive has become. So thank you everyone who came up. Thank you everyone who just encourages me to keep going on with this. And um, I encourage you right back always. I'm always like, it's, a, it's really inspiring to see no matter what age you are, no matter what year you got into clubbing, that you're still doing what you love um, and finding a way to keep electronic music um, a part of your life uh, no matter what. And it's really, really inspiring to see. So that's kind of my recap of the Sasha and John gig. Now, that was just an added bonus to this whole trip because what this whole trip about for me is um, checking out what Skyline is all about. So, um, you know, I met Graham, who is kind of the manager of Skyline and uh, the hotel that Skyline is a part of. And a lot of people, you know, I was at ADE Amsterdam and everyone was like, every club I went to, people were wearing this Skyline shirt, right? Um, and I was like, I gotta go check this out for myself. You know, you have, you have DJs like Hernan, Danny Howes, Marcelo Vasami, Nico Rada, like all raving about this skyline. And it's really one of the most exciting things going on in the underground progressive house scene. So uh, I was like, I gotta check this out. I reached out to Graham. We kind of like headed off. And so yeah, and, and they went above and beyond for welcoming me, welcoming me to Glasgow. I'm gonna play the clip of me walking into the hotel room yesterday and I literally felt like a DJ. Like it was the coolest thing ever. There was all these like assorted treats. There was, you know, just like, the best part was this little, this little note. Um, it says, hey William, a very warm welcome to Red Glasgow. Hope you have an incredible time at Skyline. If you need anything at all, please don't hesitate to ask. Best wishes, Graham. This just made me feel like right at home here, super, super welcome. I'm gonna pan the camera to the, to the view that I'm looking at right now. Like it really doesn't get, uh, it really doesn't get cooler than this. Like, look at this. So yeah, uh, it's just been, it's been an amazingly, uh, all right, let me make sure that the camera's all aligned again. It's been an amazing, amazing, amazing time here. And um, yeah, so I also have to thank, um, you know, I'm kind of recapping yesterday to get to today. The last person I want to thank, like really, really thank is 
Rami Lagu. Now, Rami's like a day one super progressive follower, but the best thing about, I always say there's so many best things about super progressive, but from a traveling perspective, this is really the coolest thing. Um, I get to go, I've never been to Scotland before, I've never been to Glasgow before, and I get to go experience these cities through the eyes of clubbers that have lived here, you know, for a very, very long time, and it's an unbelievable way to experience a new city, because you're walking around, and when there's so much stuff to see in a weekend, they kind of put it, always put it in the context of clubbing history. So, Rami, uh, we started our day, he picked me up from uh, Glasgow Central train station. We went to University Cafe for breakfast, got like a traditional Scottish breakfast, and what was so great about that was, um, you know, whenever I'm traveling to a new city, I always try and check out like if Anthony Bourdain um, had been to that city and what he thought of it, where'd he go? And we actually got breakfast and I didn't even request this or anything, but we got breakfast at University Cafe, which was amazing. And Anthony Bourdain had actually been there and loved it as well. So that was really, really, really cool. Um, and then after that, we we're just kind of walking around chatting um, and we went to the transportation museum. That was really cool. And then, and then yeah, and then we um, you know we reconnected at the gig, had a good dance on the dance floor. And Rami, you're the man, bro. Thank you for showing me your sit, baby, and like making I don't know, just people have such busy lives, and they always seem to make time for um, me when I visit, and I'm really grateful for that because it, I just I feel like I'm seeing these new cities in the coolest possible way. So thank you, bro. And that brings us up to speed to today. So today, um, you know, this is, this is just another huge day and I'll explain what we're going to do. I am about to take the camera out on a walking tour of the city with Rami. Um, we're going to see, I think we're going to stop by the locations of the Arches, the sub club and a little added special. Uh, a lot of you guys know I am like an Oasis super fan. Well, before I got into Progressive House, I shout out my freaking best friend. Nick Sen, bro, thank you for getting me into Oasis all those years ago. Um, it was like the first reason why I ever wanted to move to Manchester, way before I ever knew what the Hacienda was. And, um, but yeah, so they actually played their first gig ever here at King Tut's. So we're gonna go check that out as well. So after the walking tour with Rami, um, this is where like Graham from Skyline has just really like just gone, gone above and beyond um, he's setting me up with some interviews with Glasgow, kind of like legends of the Glasgow scene. So I'm going to be speaking to a host of different um, resident DJs at places like uh, uh, the Arches, Sub Club, Tunnel, to learn about the history of Glasgow. And I'm going to bring my camera along and we're, you know, I'll include it in the vlog and everything. And then at night, this is like, this is, you know, it all builds up to this. It's um, Elkie Klein, Miss Malira, and Tim Green at Skyline, and I'll be covering that event, and I'll be sure to include clips from that. Um, I'm not sure if they have time. They said that we could do a quick interview with the headlining artist, which would be absolutely amazing. Um, but yeah, so yesterday was amazing. Today's going to be even better. And to everybody who helps me on these trips, whether it's on location um, you know, showing me around, setting things up for me, or whether it's online, people that support the page, people that encourage me to keep going. All I can say is thank you. Let's go have an awesome day today, and I really can't wait to uh, bring you guys along. But we're going to go uh, meet up with Rami right now. Let's go. Everybody, this is my local Glasgow tour guide, Rami. Thank you so much, bro. Uh, how are you doing? All good, bro. All right, we're gonna learn a little bit about the arches. So this is the arches, the famous arches. So you can see the way it goes down. Everybody would be queuing outside, and uh, you would you would hear you would hear, you would hear the bass while you're uh, waiting uh, for the DJ, right? So the way this was, the queue used to go all the way around to the back. And uh, Sasha and Dick would, would be in there. So as you're waiting for uh, to get in, you can feel the bass and you can feel it. So what you would do is 
you go in and you go into the main art and once you're inside you start to meet all your friends you start to catch up and uh, you just head forward and forward and you see the legends that are Sasha and Digweed just right in front of you and that's you and your whole night. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like queuing up underneath the train tracks? So uh, queuing up here, this was a meeting point. Everybody would meet here. So you, you'd uh, go to the local bar, have a few drinks. So say in about uh, half past 11, half 12 o'clock, we would, we would catch up with all our friends. So we were all there. And the, the buzz, the excitement, everybody knows what they're in for. And it's, it's like uh, proper die-hard clubbers. Yeah. So once you're in, that's it. You, you were there till uh, three o'clock in the morning. Amazing, man. So what, do you have any uh, gigs that stick out in your mind of, the, of going here? The, the one that always stick out is uh, Sasha's gig when he used Ableton Life. That was one. Then they had uh, uh, Inside Out, Pressure, Slam, so many local DJs. Essential Mix came here as well. Pete Tong's Essential Mix. So many. So many good nights. But now the legendary Archies will be opening back up uh, next month. So it's good, good to see the club back. And for the new generation, at least they can see what uh, that club would do. Uh, I can't wait, like. man. It'll be good. So where are we at now, bro? This is an iconic sub club. This is one of the longest standing uh, clubs in uh, Glasgow. It's, you go down. So the, it's quite intimate. You're right next to the DJ, low ceilings, great sound system. And uh, Sasha and Digweed played here. And the uh, first time Sasha played, the, it was phenomenal, amazing. That, that's the one that's on his uh, last night on earth. Then uh, John Digweed played here. And uh, he was on till, I think, I was two in the morning. Wow. It was amazing, amazing nights here. So cool. Did the door look like this? Yeah, they, they, they open they open it up, but uh, that, 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 that's what that's what it's, it's like. And, uh, but uh, you go down. It's uh, quite intimate, and uh, the DJ booth's good in, inside, and uh, the sound system's good. And uh, some people say it's, it's like uh, fabric, the way that kind of vibe, it's that kind of vibe. But um, it's worth checking out once it's open. Yeah. You should come and check it out. Yeah, definitely, bro. Thank you. Yeah. So we are live at Skyline right now. Check out this view. Um, and we are gonna speak with um, Graham, who runs Skyline, about how Skyline came to be. We're gonna chat with John Mancini about the history of the Glasgow scene. And then we're gonna catch up with two artists who are performing tonight. Um, we have uh, two amazing DJs and producers, Tim Green and Elkie Klein. So really stoked, I hope you guys enjoy. All right, we're here with Graham. Hey. How the hell did Skyline start? How did this whole thing start, bro? How did it start? Well, um, I have a, a friend um, called Derek Martin who ran one of the biggest progressive house nights in Edinburgh uh, many years ago called Progression. It evolved into Musica. Um, and um, we were working together. He's now moved on to techno. And he runs the biggest techno festival in Scotland called Terminal V. 
and um, we basically we, we've stayed in touch for like the last 20 years and um, a kind of opportunity came up where I said I want to throw a party one day and I was like I want to book Danny and Danny, used, Danny Hills uh, he used to play for Derek a lot uh, back in the, the progression days and um, he'd do quite often all night long on the clothes and that for me has always been something that's quite special watching you know rather than just come in and do the two hour or three hour kind of peak time literally where does he start where does he go in the middle and how does he end and uh, anyway we uh, we kind of conspired this, this, this party um, which was meant to be a one off in May 2022 uh, and we also booked Gaiji um, and uh, it was a bit of a risk because we're a hotel a uh, rooftop bar in a hotel I'm not a promoter I'm a fan uh, first and foremost been following the progressive house scene for like since I've been a teenager um, my claim to fame is I went to Twilo you know uh, three times and saw Sasha and John there um, probably I don't know if it's a nostalgic thing because it's closed but while like you know I always everyone that knows me go Twilo G Graham Twilo Graham because uh, all I would talk about is Twilo 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 um, and we did this party and I couldn't believe that I had Danny coming. I kind of knew, I'd got to know Danny over the years, so I kind of felt like I knew him. Guy, obviously a new guy, knew he bought his records, but didn't know him. Uh, had met him, but he wouldn't know me, I would know him. Uh, and he agreed to do the party. Uh, they came, they did it. It was a Sunday afternoon. It was unbelievable. Uh, and I was like, wow, literally childhood dream stuff has just happened uh, in my little bar on the roof uh, of the Red Rice in Red in Glasgow. Uh, and it was amazing. Um, and then uh, I actually can't remember the rest if I'm honest like the next party was in uh, October um, I don't know at what point we decided to do a second party um, but it ended up being Nick Warren Elka Klein who's playing tonight at Skyline for his second show and um, at that point uh, a relatively unknown DJ to me uh, the name rang a bell but I could not place him uh, Nicholas Rada uh, and Nicholas Rada came in and uh, he was phenomenal uh, and he's actually been back four times uh, since so him and Guy J hold the record for the most Skyline shows tonight's Skyline number uh, 15 and they've both played four times uh, so that's uh, that's kind of uh, kind of where it started uh, it then sort of progressed from the May to the October into the November to the December um, then we didn't do anything January February and then it moved into March and from then I think the appetite I, I don't know at what point the appetite became real um, but we started doing shows it's not on the same Sunday every month um, it's very much driven by what's going on in the local area what dates I've got who's touring and the lineups are very much driven from the heart um, I'm a fan I, I always say that first and foremost I'm a fan you know um, I love the music I always have loved the music I've gone to the parties whether it's Twilo whether it's Space and Ibiza you know um, the sub club or the Archies as, they, as you've heard about well you've been here in Glasgow um, uh, Woodstock um, one of my favourite parties over in the Netherlands Lovelands um, and uh, to actually have the opportunity to bring the guys that I've followed and bought the records for the last 20 plus years has is, is, is been incredible I go to somewhere like Amsterdam for an Amsterdam dance event Every single club I walk into, there's somebody, whether it be the literal DJ, Marcelo Vasami in the main room wearing a Skyline shirt, or clubbers on the dance floor, I could not go into a single club room without somebody repping Skyline. How, how do you explain that? Like, how, how has this rooftop taken on the underground progressive scene on a global scale? <laughs> like, how does this happen? Uh, I, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I think uh, I, I'd like to think it's because I'm a fan and it's from the heart. So the programming is, it's um, you know, it's a, it's a kind of passion project, a bit of a hobby. I'm in a fortunate position to run the hotel, um, and I have the opportunity on a Sunday when it's quiet and the DJs aren't maybe touring. I have a look at you know who's in Europe or who's in the, you know, the UK, and would they come and consider a small party uh, in the rooftop uh, in Glasgow? We, um, we've we invested, as you've experienced uh, while well, you've been here, we invested in a um, void uh, sound system after we came out of COVID um, and that's given us a bit of a competitive edge in terms of, I think, speaking to all the artists, you know, you're in this um, little glass box uh, overlooking the uh, sort of, uh, some of the most iconic sites in Glasgow. Um, you start the parties like 13, 14 hours, starts off in daylight, it transpires into darkness, the sound system's incredible. You're not in a dark, dingy uh, 
um, environment. Um, you've, you know, you've got a full bar service, you can have premium cocktails, premium spirits, you can have champagne, you can have premium wine. So it's a, li it's a little bit different and I think, um, you know, I'm a, myself, I'm, a, I'm in the 40s now and I think a lot of the Skyline uh, fans that are here that are following the acts, you know, whether it's Hanan, uh, Nick, Guy, they're probably, the kind of average age is probably between 40 and 50, you know, give or take, uh, higher and lower. And I think the days of going out to like six o'clock in the morning, especially since COVID times when the world changed, I think, you know, we can come to somewhere that's kind of like a great sound system, uh, hope, uh, really good views, um, nice uh, friendly staff, uh, a banging sound system. Uh, um, and I think the Scot I think John Mincy touched on it earlier on. I, I, and again, you know, you're, you're in Scotland for the first time. I think, again, speaking to uh, Anthony Papa a couple of months ago, he, he, he made the comment that when you come to Scotland, one Scottish clubber makes up for four in the rest of the world because they're so loud and rowdy. So basically, 100 Scots is equivalent to 400 anywhere else in the world because of the energy and the enthusiasm. And that's something that I think that, um, you know, it's a really small show. We're really up close. Everyone's super excited. A Sunday show as well. It's a Sunday. Um, it's always a Sunday. Everybody, stereotypically, people work on a Monday. So if you're here today, you've probably booked tomorrow off. You've taken a holiday to be here. And you're here because you want to be here for the music. It's not, oh, I've heard there's a really cool party. Let's just go out on Friday night or Saturday. We're off Sunday. It's like, oh my God, I, I've got to, um, you know, book a holiday or I've got to tell a porky pie. I'm, I'm sick. I'm sick on Monday <laughs> to attend Skyline. Do you feel a sense of responsibility not only to like uh, keep pushing the Glasgow scene forward, but also I don't think it's ever been harder for smaller clubs to find their footing and survive yeah. in today's environment with um, just the sort of competition and the money that has entered the scene. Um, do you feel like a sense of responsibility to kind of represent not only your club, but all smaller intimate nights within the scene? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think from, again, the thing that's probably most, there's, there's two things that are overwhelming. The fact that we've got this, we call them the Skyliners, uh, the kind of Skyline community, the, the 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 fans that come every month. I mean, we walk around the room tonight and we'll say, this is so-and-so, and this is so-and-so, and this is so-and-so, and it's who holds the record for the most Skylines. Um, but then, uh, which is amazing that the people want to take an you know, opening wins and that we need to, if we're on out holidays, how many more shows are there? We need to save holidays. Can you please give us an indication? You won't tell us the lineup, but can you tell us the day? You know, what's happening? Um, and then, and then second fold is that you've got the artists um, that come and they play and then you've got, uh, and they, they seem to love it. Um, I mean Guy J, uh, I always go back to Guy J, um, one of the biggest ambassadors of Skyline that we could have possibly had. He did his first party, he loved it and he opened the door to so many people after that. Um, I would say, you know, like obviously um, like Guy Manzur, Ken, um, Ellie Nissen, um, Guy, I say Guy Mazur, um, try to go through them all. Um, Sahar Zed, Chiclo, they're, they're all coming to uh, Patrice Bommel uh, because Guy is saying, look, go and play. It's a small party, you know, it's a Sunday. It, obviously, because it's small, I mean, budgets are not huge, but you know, you'll enjoy the party. And he has literally flown the Skyline. He calls himself to me the, the Skyline ambassador. Uh, so he's my uh, Skyline ambassador, I guess, in Europe. And then Nicholas Rad, I believe it or not, the, the, you know, came for his first show. It was like, the name rings a bell, I told you that. The name rings a bell, can, can I play some? Nick Warren's production partner, right, okay, got him. Came in, first time I met him, really nice guy, really, kicking really humble, really shy. Uh, unbelievable and he closed the room back to back with Nick at the end of the night and he was absolutely incredible and from there he has introduced me to Sound XL, to Marcelo Vasami, to Antrim, uh, literally he literally goes around Argentina pimping out my phone number so I get a phone, I get a text message, hi my name is Marcelo Vasami, I'm a friend of Nicholas Rada, he gave me your number, he told me like uh, you know I'd love to come and play at Skyline because he said it's, it's really cool so if you've got any opportunity when I'm over in Europe I'd love to come and play for you so I've kind of got guys kind of doing the European, it feels like I've got my, my uh, European agent Guy J and I've got my South American agent uh, Nicholas Rada uh, and not forget Nick Warren. And Nick obviously came, he did the, he was the show number two, uh, headlined it, and then he gave me the Sound Garden exclusively for the first time in Scotland uh, in April, and that was my first label party. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, we've got our second label party next month with Moments. Moments, uh, Guy Manzur's label, never been to the UK before. Uh, he came and played back to back with, with my European agent, Guy J, in uh, March, and he says, Graham, let's, uh, let's bring Moments to Skyline, I want to do it. Um, so Ken, Chikla, and 
uh, Sahar uh, next month. Um, and then we've got two more label parties uh, in 2024, but they are uh, not for disclosing just yet. One may come out later this week, uh, and another um, is planned for a sort of special time, uh, the second birthday in uh, May. So, yeah. Sounds like a lot of exciting, exciting stuff. And I, w I was going to ask you, like, who's one person that hasn't played Skyline that you want to play? But it sounds like you already have some stuff scheduled that the Skyliners are going to be really excited oh, about. Yeah. The international community is about. So I think it's better left left kept a surprise. Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. We've got we've got we've got something. We've got uh, one particular party that um, we're working on, which I'm very excited about. Uh, if it comes to fruition, um, let's just say that. Um, if it comes off, I think it will be, uh, on paper certainly, the biggest and best, but paper doesn't always translate, um, but certainly uh, we've got something special planned. Well, I'll be up, I don't even know what it is, but I'll be up for it, bro. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you for setting, not only doing the interview, but setting up this whole weekend, bro. No, it's been, thanks a lot. I moved to the UK, I've been traveling to different cities every weekend, and this has been the best trip so far, so oh, thank you. Oh, mega, thank you, bro. Yeah, yeah, it's cheers. been great. Right. Thanks a lot. Okay, cheers. Really stoked to be chatting with you. And so, before I kind of get recording, can you kind of share with me um, an outline of what you feel like your significant contr contributions are, or what you're known for in this city? Murphy, Murphy. Um, Murphy, come here. So, basically, I was probably one of the sort of original acid house DJs in Scotland. Um, the, it was, uh, the scene sort of exploded, 88, going into 89, and I was very fortunate to have been there, and I contributed to that part of the scene. Uh, I became part of a, probably in my opinion, one of the biggest, the biggest promoters in Scotland, and the, the dance scene, the acid house scene, was, was a company called Street Rave, who progressed into colours. So, uh, and that, that's basically most of where I think my contribution to Scottish dance music, Scottish like dance music would, would, would be from, that's where it would be from. And when you, th when you kind of, um, when people talk about Glasgow, what are the, what are the clubs that were kind of the, the pioneering clubs in the scene? Because, you know, you hear sub club, you hear the arches, for you, what were the clubs that yeah, you the, played at a lot? The, the sub club would be one of the pioneers, absolutely. And then there was the first super club. And, uh, and, and Scotland, for me, the first super club was the tunnel. But then the Arches came along. The Arches was all 90, 94, I think the Arches started. So for me, those three clubs were basically what shaped uh, Glasgow scene. Absolutely. Tunnel, the Arches, and probably the sub club. There is some on the outskirts, but they were the three main clubs. Yeah, every city kind of has its own clubbing identity and own uh, kind of, you know, energy on the dance floor and what the clubbers bring to, to each club night. What would you say kind of defines the Glasgow scene? Are you allowed to swear on this? Yeah, you can fucking see. nuts. Yeah, crazy. The, the probably. It's, I've been very fortunate to have played in, in some of the biggest cities in the world, and we go to Amsterdam and various things, right? But nothing uh, comes close to the Glasgow crowd. It's really, really odd. See, we live really shit lives, right? Monday to Friday, and at the weekend, they go for it. So, they would like to, it's really odd. It's got, like, I, I, Playing in the arches and stuff, you could play a kick, a kick drum and the place would lose its shit. Just the way it just operates. They're so up for it, they're so actually, there's so much gratitude for, for good dancing music, for good DJs. And it's just totally insane. All the DJs that used to come and play at those clubs would always, would always comment on how good the crowds were. You'll hear all the, the guys, Big Reed, Sasha, or these these names that you that, and you're seeing the, the progressive scene will just love coming to Glasgow because they, they give so much back when you play. It's really, as I said, I've played in some club, some cities around the world, and I think, oh, this is a bit flat, and they'll go, no, no, it's really good, but I put it against what the Glasgow crowd is like, and the Glasgow crowd is just insane. There is nothing like it. The only thing that will probably come close to it would be the Northern Irish crowd. They're pretty nuts as well. It's probably the, the 
further north you go in the UK, the crazier it gets, up to a point. You get the south, the soft, soft southerners, as we call them, London and stuff too. There's some good scenes there, but it's not nothing compared to here. Nothing compared to the north of England, nothing compared to Scotland. It's really fucking crazy up here. So for you personally, you know, you talk about uh, like the earliest days of Acid House. How do you get into a scene when it's kind of brand new and emerging? It was, it was a youth culture movement. Um, it was late 80s and life was pretty shit. Life was, was Thatcher, life, life was the Tories, life was really quite bleak. And this movement came along. Um, and I was very fortunate to have been there at that age. I was uh, 18, 19 years old, and this came through. I was always been into music, always been into youth culture, as it skateboard and BMX and hip hop. It came through the scene, it came through, and I was quite fortunate to have been there. But this came along, and this was this was something pretty special. And none of us set out to be in it. We just got caught up in it. It came through. The football hooliganism, where it was violence and the clothes and one-upmanship and fighting, and that's where it progressed from the music scene, the acid house scene, and it, that's... So you, you don't choose to be in that, you don't even really say, I'm going to be in the acid house scene. It came along as a youth culture movement and it just exploded. It was, it was pretty insane. Um, it can sound like an old fucking morning face. The old days were better. Um, at that particular time, it was just because it was new, it was it was it was fresh, and it just came along and it just exploded. It was I can't explain how good it was. I can't explain how good it was. It's probably it's probably on par with something like somebody who's a in the next generation of clubbers went to the Archies for the first time, and they've never been to a club, and they went to the Archies, and you went, holy fuck. Something that just came along and it just grabbed you, and it was uh, it was just great to be involved in it. Yeah, can you kind of bring us inside uh, the arches in terms of how it was set up? What were some characteristics of the club? So the arches was was it's under it's under the, the Glasgow Central Railway Station. Uh, it's, it's old arches, exactly what it is. It's stone arches. They're maybe. 200 feet long, 150 feet long, I don't, I can't. and there's, there's, I think there's five of them, five or six, and they would have maybe one big room would be one DJ, then it would be a bar, and then the next one would be the next room, and that, that's what it was, old, rustic, cold, wet, fucking shithole, but it was our shithole, it was absolutely incredible. It's awesome, um, and then, so there's, the local scene that you're cultivating, but then every kind of every city, every city also has the international DJs or DJs from other cities that they love to bring in and build a special relationship yeah. with. For you, as a resident DJ, who did you identify as some of the heroes to the scene that were coming from outside of town? I was very fortunate to have played with most of the DJs coming through, from from David Guetta, Morello. Oakenfold, Sasha, Digby, everybody that came there. Um, but the ones that, 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 that are rated were probably the big, big guys. The, get, the middle of the road guys were a bit iffy. Um, my heroes were Frankie Knuckles, Carol Cox, a guy called CJ McIntosh, who used to be the Ministry of Sound resident, and, and dare I say, the late, the late um, Eric Marillo, Roger Sanchez, they were the best guys. The, the, the beauty of the Archies was that they had everybody. Everybody and anybody came there, from Sven Bath to anybody in the techno scene, anybody in the house scene, anybody in the progressive scene, they had every single DJ in the planet. So, you kind of you kind of just talked about it, like a couple of DJs that span you know different genres, but is there a specific kind of style or sound that resonated with the Glasgow audience? No, no, no. There, there wasn't a specific sound because Glasgow was the, was the epicenter for me in, in Scotland, and I tracked it. The beauty of Glasgow was that you had so many. There was some good, really good nights for the sub club and the, the arches and, and the tunnel and stuff. 
they attracted everybody, so there was never a pigeonhole sound. It wasn't a techno city, it wasn't a house city. You, you could even go down there. It was hard style, it was hardcore, it was, there was everything in, there was a bit of everything there. So to, to pin it down to one particular sound, no. But I will say, in 19, 2001, I think it was, the Arches and Colours won Club of the Year in the UK. And that was like winning an Oscar. That was massive. And that's when Colours was probably at its peak. And the residents, or the guys who came all the time, were John Digweed, or Sasha, or Anthony Papa, or Nick Warren. That was their particular sound. So you had that sound, which was championed by Colours, the progressive sound, but they also done the house sound. You'd have Pete Tong, you'd, you'd pushing Cal Cox in the techno. That's, for me, clubbing peaked at that particular time. Um, and we were, we were, we were happy to be at the front of it. And uh, yeah, that, that was that was that our particular sound at the time. The city didn't have a sound. The city was everything. That was it. When you think back to the peak of colours, are there specific gigs that come to mind? So there's a certain gig that sticks out for me. It was uh, Sasha Digweed, I think it was the Northern Exposure Tour. We had them at the Arches. But actually it wasn't the club. That was the, the standout thing. They, they, they spilled into the... So when you come out of the Arches, the entrance, it's actually covered because the railway goes over the top of it. As, as you've seen, you visited the club. And somebody had a car with a big sound system and they opened the boot and cranked it up and it was maybe six, seven, eight hundred people went for an hour outside after the club. That is a gig that sticks in my mind. It was insane. It was absolutely, I've never seen anything like it. People were standing on cars and this, I, I, the guy had a huge sound system in the back of this car. I can write up and everybody just went for it. It was insane. It was really good. Um, it's always special gigs when John and, and Sasha play. It's always special. But we had so many nights. We had absolutely loads and loads of nights. Very difficult to pick one that stands out. Totally. And in the, uh, in the same vein, are there records that come to mind that, I know I know because the records are always changing and the DJs are never really playing something twice, but are there? there Listen, the, the, yeah. the bigger ones will always stick out for, for me. When we were at the peak, it would be Expander. It would be Bedrock. It would be, be Grace not over yet, the BT mix of that, some some very epic, very atmospheric, emotional. But um, yeah, they were the big tunes that stuck out at that particular time. But there's, there's so many, there's yeah. just so many. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, that's a really hard question. Yeah, no, I hear you, man. And all right, what would you say your relationship today is like with the Glasgow scene? Um, so the Glasgow scene was, was slightly stale. Dare I say it, um, probably uh, five, six, seven years ago. Lockdown was different. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of, it's come out the other side of it and it's been really quite helpful, uh, healthy, really quite healthy on that front. And I'm very busy DJing in Glasgow. I'm still, listen, I'm an old, right, the young team have come through, it's now their turn to take it on. But there is still a lot of good old clubbers who still appreciate the, the underground or, the, or the, the anthems or whatever it is. They come just for a party, the older ones. In my opinion, they're better clubbers than the youngsters. The youngsters are still to learn their way, but it's good to see that the young team are coming through and they're creating a new scene, a new generation of good clubbers. Because you've got SWG3, you've got here at Radisson Red, you've got the sub club. The Arches is open back up as well. So there's a lot of good things happening that will help my relationship with Glasgow. Um, but, and probably a lot of new brands and stuff has been pretty healthy. The lockdown was difficult, fucking really difficult. But I, I see a nice, healthy, good new scene coming out the back of it. Yeah, my, my last question is this. You kind of reminisced a lot about the magic of this Glasgow scene. Do you think this upcoming generation can experience in today's clubbing climate the same magic that you did? It's really difficult 
to, 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 to say that. Whereas, in my opinion, I was there at the, the glory years of clubbing, where it wasn't phones, it wasn't social media, it was word of mouth, it was good, really, really good DJs who learned their craft, who were very, very hard working. Um, a lot of DJs I see coming through now are fucking shit. Unfortunately, the, the newer guy, DJs, there is some really good, but there's a lot of fakes and frauds who come through, don't make their own tunes, who, it's an Instagram DJ who have DJed for a 15 second Instagram and, and the kids think that is real DJing, because that's all they've seen, until they go and experience a new DJ, or good DJ, and they go, no, this is the sound, this is, this is real. Um, so that's the double-edged thing that I have. I think they want to experience what we experienced. They hear it for their big sisters, their mums and dads. Um, and I think they could get there. Um, there is some still pretty good parties, and I'm not knocking it, but the, the DJs who are in the scene and are at the front of the taste making for, for some of them are just bollocks. Yeah. Some of them are just fucking shit, man. Just, um, and that's un unfortunately the social media aspect of the scene, which I don't like. I, li I like uh, social media, but it creates a lot of falseness. You know how it works. Yeah. You know, you can see, you can see these people who are the frauds. They're not DJs. They're not in it for the music. They're in it to get the fame or make money or whatever it is. It wasn't. It wasn't like that when when I started or going through all the years. It's changed on that front. But I hope the, the new generation do get to experience what we got. That's, I've said this many a time, even on social media, that I feel that the kids are slightly being cheated of the experience that I had. The dance floor experience where you went and you stood and you, you just, you, you, you went on that cliche, the journey with the DJ for two or three hours, you just went and you, you trusted them and they educated you into how you should be on a dance floor in your ears. Do the kids get that at the moment in the, in, in the certain scene? No, they don't. I hope they do. I hope it comes right through in there. Yeah, fingers crossed. I, I think one of the, the best things for the scene are kind of like what I experienced last night with Sasha and John is you have a dance floor of 20 year olds, 30 year olds, 40 year olds, 50 year olds, even 60 year olds. Yeah. But um, everybody's kind of learning from each other, yeah. from clubber to clubber on the dance floor. You don't see as many phones. You see an intense focus on the music. Yeah. And it's like a good, uh, to me, that's like a good, healthy, and somewhat educational yeah. clubbing atmosphere. That's a different scene. Do you know what I mean? You yeah. put the Instagram big, these, these, some of these kids are making a really good living and I don't want to knock anybody for being successful, but they're, they're, no, they're no good DJs. Yeah. And I think the I think the kids are being cheated on that dance floor. So that's all. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you taking no the time to explain Cheers, all this. It's really nice to meet you. Cheers, man. Right, Murph. Nice job, Murph. Pretty impressive. Come here. <laughs> hey, there we go. Hey, there he is. <laughs> What's good? <laughs> no, thanks, man. <laughs> did you want to do the interview? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Is it chill? Yeah. Let's do it. Where are you from, and what scene did you come from? Um. So I'm from south of England originally. Kent is the region. Nice. A little town called Ashford. And um, the scene that I came from, what, well, so uh, my whole family is musical. I grew up playing uh, instruments in my life, guitar being my, my kind of main instrument. And so I was for a long time not into electronic music whatsoever. I was just into bands and uh, playing guitar and that was my goal for my life really was to be a, I wanted to be a session guitar player so I just wanted to like I don't know go to LA or something and be a session guitar player and then when I went to college I then started to get into electronic music and DJing and I got into pretty much at the time whatever was around you know drum and bass breaks hip-hop um, trance house what you know anything anything that was going because I had a really eclectic great group of friends that were influencing me with the music that they were into as DJs as well so I was learning how to to DJ through them and just picking up everything and that just you know because 
my main thing through my life is that I wanted to write music and produce music. So when I realized how you could be a one-man band with electronic music, you know, like sequences and everything else, I was like, I was in love. And so I, to me, it was just then that set me off on this path, which I'm still on now, which I'm loving. I'm still learning. <laughs> and um, it was, yeah, just to really create music, electronic music, and just because I could have complete control. I think that's what really attracted me to it. So, um, yeah, and I'm still on that path now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I have a question. Are you a producer that um, takes a lot of inspiration from being out? being in the outside music world, meaning going outside, going to the clubs, or do you find more inspiration in solitude when you're in the studio, kind of alone? Uh, it's like a question, people have different kind of reactions to that. Because yeah. like, I talked to uh, someone like Jody Barr, he's yeah. like really chill, but he's like, he's like days and days alone in the studio mm. and things come to me and then other guys are like, I go out and I experience the music, but what's it like for you? Um, Honestly, a, a mix of both, right. but not so much the, yeah, I mean, I don't go clubbing like I used to because I don't have yeah. the time because I spend, you know, every weekend in two or three different clubs. So I don't go as a, like a punter anymore and I have a family at home and everything, you know, so I literally don't have the time. I wish I did. So, but I, I get massively inspired when I have good shows, you know, and I play music and I'm, or, or you know, on the same show, I hear other DJs, you know, uh, do a great set or something when I'm there. So. I 100% get, you know, like inspired by that. But equally, I'm someone who really likes to be kind of in the solitude at home in the studio. But for me, it's genuinely a balance. I can't have too much of one or the other. For me, it has to be like, I, I like the time to be locked away and experiment in my studio, the solitude, I guess. But it, if I have that for too long, I go insane. Like, I, I, can't, I can't deal with it. And there's too much music in my head to try and get out and too much stuff to, uh, you know, to try and, uh, battle with like I need breaks so it's it's good in stages that's yeah. how it works for me does uh, does DJing add to your focus as a producer or take away from your focus as a producer I think add thank you sir <laughs> no 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 it's perfect man it's perfect have it awesome <laughs> thanks great um you mean, you mean add this in like help my creativity kind of thing? Yeah, like, yeah. because um, I, it helps. Uh, some, some producers say like, you know, being a DJ as well, you're spending so much time traveling that you, they don't feel like they have the necessary time to focus on their productions. Other people are like, no going out and hearing this stuff, like helps me work more efficiently maybe. Yeah, I think, uh, I think what's helpful for me, like I said before, is this kind of block stage. It, it, it's like anything with me. I'm, I'm this strange person where if I don't have some kind of a goal or let's say a deadline I feel more relaxed but if I do have the goal and the deadline I work more efficiently so they kind of contradict each other but if I can find that middle ground balance it kind of is kind of helpful so it's the same with when touring when I go away touring oh, I'm so desperate to get back in the studio it's, it's kind of healthy for me to be kind of like ah. Oh, you know, I get more ideas as I travel, as I DJ and stuff, and and I work a little bit on my laptop when I travel, but nothing too complete, you know, just little sketches and stuff like that. So when I get back to the studio, it's like, it's really quite uh, fruitful, you know, like I, I come up with a lot of stuff. But then, as I said, if, if I stayed in the studio for like two weeks solid, by the end, I'd just be like, oh, get me out of here, you know, I can't deal with it anymore. So, so that kind of balance is really, is really good for me, like that works, I think. Um, you know, traveling around as a DJ, what are some cities that have always been awesome for you? And what are cities that recently you are seeing uh, kind of on the rise or there seems getting more exciting than, maybe not unexpected, but, but the scene is growing in certain places? Um, first one that's always been good for me is Toronto. That's oh, like sick. one that's always just been really good for me, but not yeah, good for me. And I, I I would like to say you can only talk from personal experience, which is true, but obviously I have like lots of other DJ friends. Yeah. Other DJs say something different. It's just down to their personal kind of experiences. You know, some people don't find the same thing, but for me, Toronto has always just been like, I think pretty much every show I've played there, I've really enjoyed, I've, I've really had a really good time there. Um, where would be on the rise though? I mean, think where would be on the rise I honestly I don't know like I go back to a lot of the very similar kind of places I think uh, right now like I tour the states more than you know North and South America more than anywhere else probably more than Europe 
Um, so I guess there's a lot of cities that are coming through in, in America, in North America at the moment, which are doing, which is slowly getting there. My kind of a sound, you know, the, the organic kind of house, house sound is, is a relatively new thing, but it's also quite big with the burner crowds and, um, and, so, and, and people like that. So America is kind of a good place for it. You know, it's kind of got its roots in, in America anyway, I guess this kind of sound a little bit. Um, so yeah, I, I guess, yeah, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of one sort of place, but there's a lot of different cities and states in, in America that are starting to introduce this, uh, my kind of music, I call it. And um, whereas before, like they might be predominantly, you know, like bass heavy kind of music perhaps or something like, a, you know, um, and people are starting to, you know, warm up to it and there's a crowd for it and there's an interest for it, which is quite interesting. So. Um, yeah, so there's a few, there is a few places, I'd say. Yeah, but I just can't think of like, No, no, no. That's, that's, that's awesome. I mean, that's where I'm coming from, from the States. And, yeah. And it's, it's cool seeing... Um, I have a brother that's three years younger than me, and in terms of underground music, like, his generation just seems so... I think maybe it's a little bit because they're a little bit more removed from this EDM explosion that happened when I was starting to yeah. get into clubbing, where they're a little bit more removed from that and their taste is just a little bit more sophisticated, let's say, and it's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, well, it's, it's interesting, that whole movement, the EDM movement and everything. Different people have different perspectives. My perspective is that I, I think it's... I don't have any issue with it, to be honest. I think what you kind of said, like it, someone having a bit more taste or something, or um, what was the word you said? A little bit more edu educated? Yeah, sophisticated. Sophisticated. Yeah. Like, I, I think everyone, when they start at, young, at a younger age, they it's a really good foundation, but it's generally not the, the place where they end up in yeah. five years and 10 years and everything else. They, they'll find something else that's similar, but they've kind of moved on because they're, you know, they're growing up or they're changing, you know, like everyone else. So. So, you know, EDM got a, a, you know, a ton of people, as we know, into electronic music for the first time and made it quite popular. And I just think that a lot of those generations, you know, slowly the generation is going to be, you know, finding other electronic yeah. music more underground and everything and filtering through as they get older. So I don't necessarily see it as a bad thing, you know, no. I think it's like an entry point. You know? I think it's a good thing for the scene where more kids than ever before in history are exposed to and comfortable with electronic music. Yeah. You know, it, it makes for just more people to go out and find other stuff that they like, as you said. Exactly. exactly. It's, it, it's chill. Now, this balance mix is a, of huge interest for me because um, balance to me is one of those things that connects the history of this music with the present because there's only so many mixed compilation series that exist today that yeah. have their roots in in the past yeah. and they kind of represent everything that's so cool for me that Australian you know them being from Australia they're doing they're doing that whole thing as a as a producer and as a DJ did you approach so it's a studio mix album it's not necessary it's different than live DJing did you approach this mix with more of a DJ mindset or a producer mindset in terms of the programming and the arrangement of what you were trying to achieve? Um, well, I, I included a hell of a lot of sort of, a, I, I call it exclusive material because there was a lot of stuff that was edits that I did. There, right. there was some, uh, how many, I think I did like three originals, one remix or something that was exclusive. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm saying. Like, uh, yeah, and then, and then it was like maybe about, I, I can't remember what it was, something silly like 10 edits because I, like that I made. So, you know, I, I guess it, they're exclusives, but they're not like original from me. But so there was a lot of it that was very much, um, you know, very personal, I guess, to me, you know, like, and most people didn't have any of those tracks. Um, so that was the producer side of me coming in. But so I, and I knew I wanted to be able to include all of that stuff on there. But when I programmed it, I literally thought of it as a DJ set. And, and, and also because there's two CDs that, you know, Balance said to me, you can do one, think of it as one continuous mix if you wanted, or, you know, two separate. I, I think they initially wanted two separate. And I said, I prefer to think of it as one continuous mix, which is what I, what I did, you know, spanning over the two CDs. So I really just programmed it, honestly, I have a very one kind of like one track mind when it comes to DJing and 
maybe I'm simplifying it too much, but I didn't want to overcomplicate it. I literally wanted to, to make it something that someone could listen to from start to end as a journey that would represent completely what the music I, I'm into right now, currently. Um, and and that was it, you know, nothing more. I didn't want to try and be like, oh, this is like the most fantastic, crazy mix sort of a thing. I'm very much like a traditional kind of DJ. I, I like the songs to speak for themselves and then and the flow of the mix is what, you know, creates the journey. So I really programmed it, you know, as if I was playing in a night sort of a thing. If I had, if I, you know, if I was to program a night, which I don't, but, um, you know, it's, it, that mentality was there as if an audience was on the dance floor sort of thing. Because I think you can do both. I, I don't think it's one or the other, like something you listen to at home or something you hear in the club. I think you can do both. And that's what I, you know, that was my goal. And that's what I tried to do. Basically. I have one more DJ relating question and then one personal question. Um, this is obviously a unique space skyline. It's mm. this like intimate club. It's this intimate space, but with like a proper club sound. What do you get out of uh, DJing for intimate uh, spaces? And what do you get out of the larger gigs? Yeah, the intimate generally am I preferred. I think just for the obvious, it's more like an immediate response type feeling of <coughs> being, you know, close to the crowd, close proximity, being, you know, just, uh, you know, without the obvious of literally being able to see people's expressions and everything, but just the closer you are, the, the easier it is to sort of feel the vibe of people and the energy and everything, you know, what, what kind of state they're in, what kind of music they're responding to that I might be playing, what they might not be responding to, etc., etc. And that can be really hard in playing a, a bigger kind of event because it's just, you know, sea of people, you know, so it's quite hard to sort of sometimes gauge what they want. Equally though, sometimes those kind of gigs are quite obvious um, or easier because you're just kind of like, well, you've just got to play the high energy music, quite obviously, you know, and that's what's going to work because you need to kind of connect and that's the easy way you're going to connect. You're probably not going to connect by going on a very weird, or, you know, eclectic kind of a <laughs> odd journey sort of thing, you're going to lose them sort of thing. So I guess each one has its plus and, and minuses. Uh, I, I, I'm lucky enough that I get to sort of play both and, and have done in my career. So I, I've sort of experienced both and um, genuinely I, I really like them both. Again, a balance is kind of like, I, you know, I like doing both. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like doing both of them if I can. Um, last question kind of revolves around this word balance, which mm. obviously in our, like there's the compilation, but the, just the balance, um, you, you're a guy with, you know, you're, you're like a relatively young guy that has found success both in the scene and then in your personal life. What are some things that inspire you outside of the music scene that you can bring in to your work um, and can find continuous sources of inspiration with? Yeah, I mean, I'm so... First of all, my family, my wife and my kids, just because they're like awesome and my wife's so supportive and I wouldn't be anywhere without her. And I, and I mean that even from, you know, years and years ago, she sort of changed my music taste for the better and guided my music taste for the better as well, I guess. So, and, um, and then, um, and also I'm a really melancholic kind of a guy. So I'm someone who draws a lot on, kind of, let's say like past experiences of, um, you know, memories that I have with friends or any kind of an experience or something. I always draw upon that when I sort of do music. That's kind of one of my biggest um, inspirations, just, uh, you know, just being melancholic, just like thinking back to like, oh, you know, I had such a great time in that moment. I had such a good vibe and a feeling and I somehow try and put that into, into my songs. So, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't know even know how I do it. I don't even know if I successfully do it, but it's enough for me as a catalyst, as a, like an inspiration, you know, for me to start doing music. And again, like if one percent of that feeling got into the the track, then I'm I'm happy. You know what I mean? Then I've, I've managed to get something something into that song. So they're kind of like my um, yeah, my biggest inspirations, I think. And and when I became a dad as well, like that changed everything because I just became much more relaxed as because my kids just like, I, well, my, my oldest daughter, she, um, when she came along, I was just like, I realized how 
much I cared about her and how important she was that everything else just didn't really matter. You know, everything else just then sorted itself. So all the stuff I used to worry about, think about, and everything else is like, ah, oh, whatever, it doesn't really matter. As long as my daughter's okay, everything else is good. And it just, you know, sorts out, like, the order, the hierarchy of things in, in your mind. So everything just became easier. And that, in turn, I, I just wrote music easier and without, you know, stress-free, I guess, or something, which was great. So that was quite a nice uh, turning point. Yeah, man. Well, I appreciate it. Thank this you very really much. Nice, and it's really nice to meet you. No, so. thanks very much. Yeah, yeah this appreciate is awesome. It. Cheers. Thanks, Mr. Green. So, okay, I'm going to keep this super chill, but yeah. um, you're coming in from Budapest. Yeah. Um, you're now in a city in a whole different part of the world, whole different uh, part of Europe. You have a global audience. How do you, how do you, uh, you play a set in Budapest. Are you coming with the same mindset of I'm going to play the music I like? Are you playing to crowds that you've built relationships with over the years in different parts of the world? Um, well, Budapest, I have been coming there since 2006 on a yearly basis. So I, I have a lot of history there. That's almost 18, 17, 18 years now or so. Here in Glasgow, this is only my, my second time. Um, but I'm not someone that really, I don't really prepare a set so much. I, I, I do a general preparation where <clears throat> I have a lot of different tracks and sounds and even styles that I might want to play. And then on the night itself, I will see like, okay, how is the vibe? How is the DJ before me playing? What are his record choices? And then I will, you know, I take over and I build on that. And I usually, I don't think very far ahead, like two or three tracks or so at most. Um, so even for tonight, I don't know, it depends on what Tim is playing, like how I am going to start my set, um, which is nice. It's like a challenge every, every time. So you, you um, it's really cool to me that you play a lot of gigs around the same bills with these um, progressive house legends, maybe some of the guys that got you into this music in oh, yeah. the first place. What is the same about them as DJs and what have you noticed that they've kind of changed over the years for you? Do you understand um, what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah. What, what about that made that they did that helped you fall in love with this music is still there? And then what's some stuff that's unexpected? Um, well, I think, you know, uh, most of these guys, like Sasha, Hernan, uh, John, I, I started going out to like proper nightclubs when I was about 18 or so, you know, the, the, the years before that was just like random bars and stuff, but 18, which is now 22 years ago for me, there was this party in Amsterdam called Earth, and it was a monthly uh, event at the Melkweg, and they would get... All, all these guys that we're talking about, they would get them like one by one every month. So one night it was John, the next month it was Sasha, then it was Dave Seaman, and that went on and on and on. So that was a big part of my, my upbringing, sort of. I was al always there as a clubber. And uh, I would say the, the biggest difference between then and now is mostly just that the music has changed, of course, you know, the, the, the tempo went a lot lower and, and now it's, it's higher again. Um, but I, I think with all of them, like the way I experienced them back in, in the early 2000s and the late 90s is, well, you, if you listen to a global underground of those days, you can, you can see how it was back then. It was trans and progressive were a little bit more intertwined, I think. Nowadays, they are more clearly separate. Like those sounds have sort of developed into their own sort of area. Um, but it's, and, and also my own sound. I mean, I started playing as well when I was like early, like late 18, 19 years old. So my, my sound was different back then as well than, than compared to how it is nowadays. Um, yeah, and I like that, you know, and I, I don't like things that are still. There should always be some kind of progression, I think. Well, I had one of the coolest experiences ever at ADE. Sander Kleinenberg picked me up yeah. on his scooter and took me on a uh, music tour of Amsterdam and took me inside Milkweg. Yeah. Did, like, and, and to see him, like, he, he showed me, he had like goosebumps on his arm. He hadn't been inside yeah. there in so long. 
was was he one of the DJs that you were, were that you were going to see when you were? Well, uh, not not just going to see the the party that I referenced. Earth. Yeah, Earth. That's Earth, him, right? That, that's him. Yeah, yeah. that was uh, DJ Pear and Sander Kleinenberg together in the beginning, and then at one point they split up and Sander left, and you know he started playing internationally. But Pear still continued to do the parties. Uh, so yeah, that that party that we were talking about, that was basically him and and Pear, and I, I went there so many times, you know. Oh, it, it just seemed it seems so cool, and and yeah, Sander to me is just one of the coolest coolest guys in the scene like he I don't know he uh, he's so humble about what he considers a small contribution I'm like dude that was like one of the major contributions yeah. it's, it's so cool no he had a he had a really distinct unique sound in those days you know and I, I played a lot of his tracks and I, I listened to a lot of his his music as well I have I have a lot of vinyl from those days the four seasons EP like the double EPs and everything it's still in, in, in my collection it's part of my upbringing I guess yeah um, as a DJ that found success really young um, in the scene what are some things that you've learned from uh, the people that you looked up to that now you're trying to pass on to younger DJs that are now coming up? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, mostly from the perspective of a producer because I think DJing has changed tremendously in those 20 years, you know? It's, 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 it's almost DJing now and DJing back then are, are, are very different things, I think. As, as a producer, one of the most important things I learned is like quality over quantity. I guess that goes for a lot of things, but also very much for, for writing music, quality over quantity. It's like you, it, it does much more for your career if you release two or three amazing tracks in one year than if you do 20 okay-ish sort of tunes, you know? Um, and especially nowadays when there's so much music coming out and so many people trying to break into the scene. Um, that, that makes a very big difference. Um, but DJ-wise, like I was saying, I, I think the two are, I mean, when I remember some of my earliest gigs, you know, I was playing Lebanon and in BO18, that, that famous nightclub where the, the roof opens. And back then the DJ booth was, and, and this is no joke, it was sort of in the corner of the booth behind a concrete pillar. And when you were playing, you couldn't even see half the dance floor. You were si sort of side at the side of the bar, just as you know someone else working at the club, like like the bouncer or the bartender or everyone else. Um, now it's like your center stage, lights on top of you, um, high above the crowd. It, it, it's changed a lot, you know. It, 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 it's you're almost more of an entertainer than you are just like a music curator nowadays. Um, which I, I know, I have mixed feelings about, but... <laughs> um, kind of an interesting question for you. When, when you had broke into the scene and you were just um, coming into the scene, there were these platforms. There was platforms for DJs to have breakthroughs, whether it be an essential mix yeah. or whether it be uh, as a DJ um, getting you know a global underground city series or as a producer like yeah. you being featured on a Nick Warren global yeah. underground yeah now with the scene more saturated today those platforms are different how are DJs in the current generation like where are they experiencing breakthroughs since there's no longer the prevalence of like a global underground city album happening multiple yeah. times a year an essential mix that the whole dance community listens yeah. to each week what are the new platforms do you think i mean um it's the platforms that have changed but they're still there you know i mean back in those days we're talking glowed underground renaissance cocoon like those were important um uh, you know labels to be to release on and and for me it was indeed it was my sort of big break came when when nick did his um included my track 8-bit era on on his gu paris yeah i think it was 27 or 28 yeah, yeah. um 20 27 30 maybe yeah, some, yeah, something, yeah. Maybe, something around 20, yeah that. yeah something. yeah and then because i was featured on that i got in touch with global underground so when i did my first artist album it was on their label and you know that that put you right up there and these days y you're looking at like afterlife or kind of music or you know there's a drum code there's still platforms like that where if you get featured on them it kickstarts your career 
it's just different platforms than you know back in those days and then there's you know the question of so much more competition and people sort of fighting for attention but those i think those possibilities are, are still there oh awesome yeah. um can ask you a couple questions that I asked him as well, but you are a international traveling DJ. What's a, what's a city for you that has always been uh, really consistent and something that you've looked forward to and have viewed as having a really quality scene? And what's one of the cities that you've seen a lot of recent growth and enthusiasm in that maybe wasn't there when you first started? Yeah. Um, well, for me personally, one of the best cities, and, and this probably is the same as what many people say, but is, is Buenos Aires. is an amazing, absolutely amazing city. I played there for the first time in, in 2008, warming up for Hernan at this really huge uh, event called Moon Park. And I've, I've basically been back every year, sometimes twice a year. Um, and it's always been amazing, you know? And there's, there's um, as a DJ, you get, many hours you get four or five sometimes six hours to play your set people will be there for the entire t of your set they they don't leave early if you play until seven they're there until seven if you play until 10 they're, they'll be there until 10 so yeah it's just an amazing amazing place to play music and then some places that have really grown in my opinion are um, middle east for instance i was at dubai uh, recently or i mean i, I go to dubai every every other year every few years but the first time i came there was 2007 or 8 and it was still a very intimate scene i was playing with uh, Raxon, who was a, a resident dj at 360 in those days and you felt it was a tiny blimp on like this city which was in development you know whereas nowadays they have multiple super clubs and you know eight thousand people here two thousand people there ten thousand people it's it's yeah it's, it's grown tremendously so um and I'm, I'm expecting more i think i you know you see saudi arabia very rapidly developing at the moment with their middle beast festival and stuff like that so i i presume I'll go there more often in the future as well. Nice. Um, you know, DJ, top of your game. I, I'm sure these 200 person capacity clubs, 250 capacity clubs uh, become fewer and fewer over time throughout your career. Are, th are these intimate gigs something that you look forward to when they pop up? Oh, definitely. I mean, it's a, I, I like playing intimate venues. Um, it is true that like the, the more your career progresses, the, the fewer you get to play them. Um, but the vibe is is you know unparalleled sometimes. Sometimes if you play the bigger venues, I mean don't don't get me wrong, I love to play those as well. But it can feel quite lonely up there on a huge stage where the people are 20 meters in front of you, and you kind of only see the first row of people, and after that it just becomes this big blur, you know. Whereas here it it, it feels much more intimate with everybody right up in your face and um, I'm, I'm happy when when those shows come through yeah definitely and my final question is is when you get some time to yourself to chill when you're not doing music how do you like to spend your time uh, I love playing Xbox there you uh, go yeah play play a lot of video games um, and otherwise I, I go to the gym and I and to be very honest I also just like to do absolutely nothing sometimes because you know with the travel and with the playing you, you can get so so busy where you don't it, I mean travel is not super hard work but it's still like I'm, I'm in the during the week I'm in the studio and then in the weekend I'm traveling so it's like you almost never really have completely off time and then when I do get a weekend off sometimes I just like to do nothing just watch some sh series and play some Xbox and that's it what games do you play uh, Fortnite with my daughter nice. uh, which we're both quite invested in uh, and then I love um, games like like Skyrim or Elden Ring or you know some of the bigger RPGs um, yeah, a lot, lot of those. Are you excited on the OG Fortnite coming back? Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm already playing. I'm, yeah. um, I'm already up to like level level 39 or something. Uh, <laughs> Fortnite is a, it became a quite a big hobby of mine. Like, because the funny thing is, my daughter is now 11, 
and during COVID, she said she wanted to play Fortnite, and I didn't really know the game. So, I, but I looked into it. And I was like, "Yeah, it's a, it's a shooter. You probably won't like it." But she was very persistent, and then she started playing. But she couldn't really work out the controls in the beginning. So I was like, "Okay, I'll join you." And I am now probably the the, the, the bigger fan of the series <laughs> than she is. But uh, no, we we do we played a lot together. Yeah, well, it's awesome, man. I really appreciate you taking time. Yeah, of I course. Hope you have a, a blast with uh, this this room tonight. Thank you. But this was awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah.